You know, I, I don't do shopping. I'm not very good at it. I tend to frustrate my wife if I go with her to participate with her in some form of shopping, whether it be for groceries or clothes or whatever it may be. Now, don't get me wrong, we like to go to, oh, I don't know, some used store, you know, a secondhand store, whatever you want to call it, and uh, we'll go in, you know, and she'll go that way and I'll go that way, because <laughs> we don't agree on anything, necessarily, but through my actions of constantly doing certain purchases and doing things, she likewise has become very, you could say, conservative in her pricing because valuation or placing a value on something is really only determined by one thing, if someone buys it. You see, I could call this cup worth billions of dollars, but until someone buys it, it's just me calling it that. It's kind of the way the stock market works, by the way, but anyways, <laughs> forget about that. But the reality is if someone paid me a billion dollars for this cup, then I made a million dollars, but then also that cup was worth a billion dollars because it was purchased for that. So when I go into a store, I look at the price first. I don't even bother looking at the item. The item might catch my attention that I might be interested in. But before I look closely, I notice the price. And if it's unreasonable, I don't even bother. Now, one thing that was interesting was when I lived overseas, like in Jerusalem, in Israel, I would, of course, see things that I knew darn well, you know, whether they were made in Israel or made somewhere else and brought there or whatever, bargaining. But likewise, it was fun to share with, you know, the, the haggling or the negotiations. And then sometimes I would throw in extra just for the fun of debating and discussion. But the point being is that when you live there long enough, you begin to know what's real and what's not. Well, likewise, I don't know if anybody's ever told you, but there's a price to being a Christian. There's a cost to being saved. It isn't a free ride. It isn't just something where you go, you know, I've been watching these guys over here, and I've been watching those guys over there, and you know, I think I like these guys over here, so I'm just going to kind of go along for the ride, and it's not going to cost me anything, so I'm just going to go ahead and get this grace they talk about. And, you know, it's going to make me have a wonderful life and a purpose-driven life and everything's going to be purposeful, you know, and I'm going to go along with the programs and basically accomplish what, you know, really I need to do in order to get to heaven. There's more to Christianity than sucking your thumb. There's more to the price tag than just simply saying, okay, I'll take it. No. You see, you need to look at what really is the price of what you're purchasing because that will determine whether or not you value what you have or whether or not you're going to be blown out of the water when the struggles come that prove whether you are going to follow up with what you say you are as far as being a Christian is concerned because anyone can call themselves a Christian anyone can say they have a personal relationship with God anyone can maybe even demonstrate some miraculous power or some goofy little charismatic kind of rolling around on the floor or barking like a dog or speaking in some unknown language or even mimicking it from television programs. Maybe even feeling the corporate oh, buzz that you get from worship. But the reality is only Jesus knows what you do when no one's looking. Only Jesus knows what you're like when no one's around. And only Jesus knows when the moment is right for you to pay the price of being a disciple, which means to lay down your life, not only for your friends, but maybe even for your enemies. Today, in my utmost, are you discouraged in devotion? Yet, lack, yet you lack one thing, sell all you have and come follow me, from Luke 18.22. And when he heard this, have you ever heard the master say a hard word to you? Has he ever told you something you don't want to do? If you have not, I question whether you have heard him say anything at all. Jesus Christ says a great deal that we listen to, but do not hear. We don't want to. It's too personal. It's too real. 
when we do hear it, his words are amazing because they're not the sugar-coated candy we were given, but rather they're hard and tough and cost us something. Jesus did not seem in the least solicitous that this man should do what he told him. Jesus did not make it easy for the man to follow him, but rather told him what he was missing in his life. He made no attempt to keep him with him. He didn't try to persuade him over and over and over again with an altar call to come and follow him. No, he made it tough because it is rough and it is not a fact that no matter what, you should come forward. He simply said, sell all you have, come follow me. Our Lord never pleaded, he never cajoled, he never begged, he never entrapped, he never tricked, he never gave any kind of forced spiritual loss. He simply spoke the sternest words mortal ears have ever listened to, and then he left it alone. It was not his determination of who should come, but God the Father's. Have I ever heard Jesus say a hard word? Have I ever heard a gospel message that was tough to come to Jesus, that made it hard to follow him? Has he said something personally to me that I have deliberately listened or not listened to? Have I ignored what Jesus said? Am I doing what he has told me to? Not something I can expound or say this and that about, but something I have heard him say personally only to me. Have you? Has Jesus told you something you need to do? And have you ignored it? This man did not understand what Jesus said. He heard it. He sized up what it meant, and it broke his heart. He did not go away defiant. He went away sorrowful, thoroughly discouraged, bummed out, blown out, because he knew what it meant. He had come to Jesus full of the fire of earnest desire. He was ready to go. He was ready to run forward and give Jesus his life. And the word of Jesus simply froze him, stopped him in his tracks, made him recognize the price, the cost of being his disciple. Instead of producing an enthusiastic devotion, it produced a heartbreaking discouragement. Has Jesus ever really spoken to you? Do you know this Jesus too? And Jesus did not go after him. He let him go. Are you begging people into the kingdom of God? Our Lord knows perfectly that when once his word is heard, it will bear fruit sooner or later. The terrible thing is that some of us prevented bearing fruit in actual life. I wonder why we will say when we do make up our minds to be devoted to him on that particular point. One thing is certain, he will never cast anything up at us. Jesus is always presenting the factual reality of what it means to follow him. He never minced words. He never pretended. He never contended of why people would follow him. He spoke often to crowds that followed him for miracles, and they walked away when he challenged them about that. He spoke often things that they could not bear to hear, and at the time they walked away thinking about it. You see, it's not enough to just make someone come when they don't really want to. But it is something to share the facts and reality of how much it costs when you do follow Jesus. Because if you're presenting Jesus in any other way, it's not Jesus tells me this I know for the Bible tells me so, but it's Jesus who said, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. Because if they've done so to the master, they will do so to you. Jesus doesn't bid a man to come and live. He bids a man to come and die. Do you know what the price is to follow Jesus?